Welcome, the widower of Nina Riggs, John Duberstein, here with the Atlantic's Ross Anderson. Um, John, thanks for being with us today and uh, for sharing that, that brief glimpse of Nina. It was really lovely. Um, I want to ask you, it's been almost uh, two years now. How are you holding up? Well, when Nina, Nina died in February of 2017, so um, shortly after the Trump administration began, so relative to the state of the country, <laughs> I'm actually doing relative. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying, to, <laughs> trying to spin this. No, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm, yeah. I am doing all right. I think it's true that um, you're in sort of a blast zone when you lose a, a intimate partner, and the only thing you can do is keep. Um, you do not get better, but you, it does get better with time. Um, the, the impact of it, the, the feeling of loss never goes away, but, um, but it lessens and, and you do start to get more functional, I hope. Yeah. Uh, give us, we, we heard a little bit from Nina just now, but give us a sense of after Nina published this essay in the New York Times, which if uh, anyone in this room has not read this uh, column, it's really quite a wonderful, moving thing. And uh, the book also is, is just uh, a beautiful object and also a beautiful book. Um, but uh, tell us a little bit about those weeks. I mean, uh, you know, the sort of being in the late stages of a terminal disease can, uh, is obviously, uh, can be quite a grim time. Um, and uh, not everyone has something like this happen. Like, what was that? What sort of emotional energy poured into your family when this, when this happened? Well, the, I mean, the modern love column is such a phenomenon, and, and Nina yeah. talked about it in the video more um, eloquently than I can. Um, but it was pretty amazing. I mean, it was a major whirlwind. We went from, um, you know, we're dealing with this terminal diagnosis, we're trying to figure out how to live our lives, and then um, within a very short time after publication of the, of the piece in the New York Times, she signed a book deal and she was writing a memoir. Um, and so that became this major project, this major thing um, that was happening in the midst of all this other stuff. Um, but it was, um, it was incredibly, um, invigorating for her, um, both as a writer and just, you know, at that time in our lives, obviously, yeah. um, it was just to, like she described, to be showered with good feelings um, coming back at her from the publication of this one essay. Um, and I, I had completely forgotten until I rewatched the video that people did, they donated, I mean, people get sent money to us. Like, it, I mean, <laughs> we, we didn't do anything to earn it. We didn't, you know, there, yeah. um, we paid taxes and all that, don't worry. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but people just meant well and they expressed it, you know, and, and, and then it turned into this great um, literary project for her, which um, was, was just tremendous at that time and, and really sustaining. Yeah. Uh, I know that writing has become one of the sort of chief therapeutic activities for people, uh, not just with a terminal disease, but who are struggling with cancer in general. Uh, was this, and, and Nina's a bit unusual because, you know, previous to this, she had been quite an accomplished and wonderful writer and poet. Uh, was this something that she was doing kind of as a coping activity, or was this a real kind of earnest effort to leave some really vivid sense of herself for you and for the kids after she was gone? Yeah, I mean, I think she did do that, leave a legacy, a tremendous one. Um, but I think that was more for me um, and yeah. for the kids. It's sort of a byproduct. Um, I think for Nina, I don't know that it was just a coping mechanism because I think she, I, I, I believe, if I'm not misstating this, that she wrote her first um, piece of literature at like age five and a half or something like that. Like she knew she was going to be a writer very early on. Um, but I think the, the sort of lightning strike of this, of the um, New York Times article giving her a platform gave her focus and shape and a purpose at a time when, um, as she said in the video, you, you're, you have to live in the everyday, you have to live in, the, in a moment to moment thing. Um, and if you think about life as a timeline, which you know the kind you learn in elementary school or whatever, you, you don't actually think of your own life as having a terminal end of that timeline until, yeah. you, know, until you do. But when you have cancer, even if it's not terminal cancer, you start to think about that. And yeah. that uncertainty can really um, blow your life apart, and so having this purpose, having a, a literary purpose um, and a focus really helped her a tremendous amount, and, and she wrote most of the book over, the, it was about four months at the end of her life, and she'd written the blog, 
Um, she had some essays that she'd written. Um, but it all happened relatively quickly and in an intense way. Um, so in that sense, I do think there was, I don't think it was done as a coping mechanism, but I think it definitely provided that. I mean, it was a place where she could go, um, where she felt rewarded and, um, and like she was mm. saying really, things that were really important to her. She was giving shape to thoughts and ideas and feelings that she had. Um, that she, you know, Nina always wanted to transmute whatever um, she was doing into something beautiful, into art. Um, and this was the, the highest and best version of that that she ever found. Uh, you yourself have been doing some writing, uh, and you're modest about it, but some, some actually some good writing. Uh, <laughs> and I want to ask you, has that been, first of all, how's that experience been for you? But also, uh, writing, I, at least for me, is, is quite a struggle. I always think of it, that it sort of, it confronts you with kind of the lack of clarity in your own thinking, which is, yeah. uh, can make you feel small. Um, is that a way to connect to Nina even now, that sort of sharing that same headspace, you know, of, of being writerly uh, now? Does that, do you feel like, oh yeah, maybe that's what she was going through? I, I feel embarrassed to compare myself to <laughs> Nina. I, mean, I really do, um, not just being modest. But um, for me, I think it's in some ways it's the opposite it, that it was for Nina. I, for me, it did kind of start as a, as a coping mechanism. As a, I had a lot of displaced energy that I realized was churning around that needed mm. shape and needed... Um, a place to go. I don't have any background as a writer, um, and I try to do exactly what you were saying, to take things that aren't clear and process them through the filter of, I, I'm, it's a blog, it's, a, it's on Blogger, it's really, the production value is super low, very and the, the editing is me, so it's <laughs> poor. Um, but, um, but it does really help with that stuff, with what you were just mentioning. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you are foggy, if you are frustrated, if you are lonely, um, all of which I am at times, um, you know, it can be a way to channel some of that. And, and what I've found is that it turns into agitation. It turns into mm. frustration. That can come out in, at work or in parenting or in, in a number of ways. And, and it also turns into um, being disconnected from the world, I, I think, because when you feel bad, um, which you are going to do in the circumstances that I'm in, you withdraw, and this is a way, even if I have a very small audience, and if you guys all go and visit the blog, I'll have a slightly larger audience. Um, <laughs> but it's mostly my friends and family, but it, it's a real connection, and people mention it to me. They'll say, oh yeah, yeah, I already know that story. I, you, I read it on your post the other day. <laughs> now my cocktail parties are ruined. But, yeah. um, but um, there is that connection, and, and, yeah. and it, it, exp it pulls the scab off a little bit. It's like I'm not hiding anything. I'm, I'm exposing yeah. that the frustration and the struggle and stuff, and, and that's, um, that's therapeutic, I think, for me. Mm. Uh, one of the really lovely and distinctive things about this book uh, is this sort of running dialogue with Ralph Waldo, Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, co-founder of The Atlantic, in, incidentally. Uh, but uh, more importantly was Nina's great-great-great-grandfather, um, and you'll correct me on the, no, that's right. the number of greats. Got it. Um, was that, uh, previously, was that something that was like active in Nina's life or was that more of a literary relationship? It, it was actually more a life relationship. I mean, the, the, so the, the, her dad and his siblings, he comes from a big family, share a vacation house and there's a portrait of Emerson over the mantle. I mean, he's, the, he's their great, great grandfather. It's, it's not that remote. Um, and, and there's a legacy there that's just, he's sort of the great man in the family and the family is quite big. Um, but, um, but also in, in the smaller version of that family. So it was more of that for most of her life. And um, Nina, I think in the book, talks about being in you know, literature classes and the professor, her letting it slip or whatever, and the professor all of a sudden was very interested in her um, where they hadn't been before. So it was a little bit of a, of a, you know, a weight around her neck in some ways because she was an English major and a writer. And um, I don't think it was until she wrote the book that she really found the literary connection. Um, she'd never written nonfiction before. I mean, Emerson is... I think probably the preeminent American essayist, or at least mm. of the 19th century, and and I'm not just saying that because the Atlantic is our host, <laughs> um, but um, <coughs> she really she changed genre. She changed. Mm. She never felt like she could ever write in any other form other than verse before, and she found a, a vein for this book that was much much closer to what Emerson did, and then also mm. a lot closer to the themes that he wrote about. Um, so, you know, it was circumstance that dictated that, but I think there's, there, you know, there was an obvious reason why she included that stuff in the book. Um, it's important to her family, hmm. but it was also important to the literary project. So, yeah, she, she found that um, in the process of doing this. Yeah. Um, 
in the book, Nina talks about Dr. Kavanaugh, which is a pseudonym uh, yes. for her oncologist, and they had sort of a, a really kind of interesting relationship that plays out over the course of the book, including, I mean, I, well, I'll let you tell it, but uh, when Dr. Kavanaugh found out about Nina's literary career. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about that relationship and just sort of what you've learned watching that about, you know, kind of all the many roles that doctors play uh, in these situations. Yeah. I mean, we had a really positive relationship with Nina's oncologist. Uh, in the original essay that Nina published, there's a passage where she characterizes the oncologist. It's brief, but it's descriptive. And it's, you know, it, I, I think she says it's a mixture of, I have, I'm going to get the words all wrong, but it's something in arrogance. Arrogance is in there. Um, there's a lot of positive adjectives used too, but, um, but, but it's a really accurate description, I think, of her doctor in particular. And then we found out later, sort of circuitously, through it had been posted on a, on a women's physician's listserv that's nationwide, and a whole bunch of people had responded to that description and said, this is the best characterization I've ever heard of an oncologist, and this was a, an oncologist saying it. Um, it's hugely important, that relationship. And there were times where Nina was really frustrated because you're, you know, here you are, you're dying, and you can't always just call your oncologist. You can't, you know, they're not, they're not concierges. They're, they're very busy physicians, unfortunately, no matter how much we wish we could. Um, but I think, you know, it, it, the, the thing that came up that you were mentioning that was so revealing in retrospect, I guess, is this one visit we went to see um, Nina's oncologist, and she sort of jokingly came in and said, so do you have anything you want to tell me? And we were like, uh, has anything changed? Does, you know, drugs, problems with, with opiates and whatever. And she was like, <clears throat> the New York Times, and I, so apparently Nina hadn't let the doctor know that this piece was going to be coming out, and um, she, she, she said, no, it's okay, I've adjusted to my characterization, I'm comfortable with it now, it's, it's already sat with me for a couple of weeks. But my sort of takeaway from that after the fact, at the time we were like a little traumatized, like, oh no, we're, we've, we've made the oncologist mad, we don't want to, she's, she's kind of fierce, the oncologist, yeah. um, lovely, wonderful doctor, but, but a little scary. Um, I would not have necessarily wanted to be her resident, let me just say that. I was yeah. glad to be um, the husband of her patient. Um, and, but my takeaway from that was that, so there's this whole concept of narrative medicine that I really didn't know about before I had a spouse who was, who was uh, writing about um, some of that, her writing overlaps with some of that, but it's a huge field and it's a huge thing. And, um, and narrative in general is hugely important. It's become hugely important in my life, partly because of the book, but also because we all have to tell ourselves a story about the things that happen to us. And if one of the things that happens to you is that you're diagnosed with cancer, that can be a really difficult story to tell, and it's so multifaceted. And um, in that moment, Nina's doctor had the realization, which she hadn't been prepared for, that she was an integral part of the narrative. Um, her narrative happened to be published in the New York Times and then come out as a book, <laughs> but regardless of whether Nina had written about it, for every patient that she treated, she was an integral part of that patient's narrative. And so I, I just, you know, I think it, it really brought out that doctor-patient piece in relationship to, to, you know, contributing to that narrative, to, to mm -hmm. taking an, exercising an active role in that narrative, um, I think is hugely important for doctors um, and obviously massively important for patients. Yeah. Um, as a devoted reader of your blog, uh, I learned that you're the one. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that uh, that you've had this kind of approach lately, where you're saying that um, you know that at first you were sort of in fight or flight mode uh, after Nina passed, and you know you're you're parenting two small boys. Um, they're 11 and 9 now, Freddie and Benny. Yep. Uh, and that now you're realizing it's it's more of a marathon, and I I wonder how. How are those boys holding up, first of all? And you know, what's that been like? What are the sort of marathon scale challenges that are now becoming clear to you? The, the boys are great, mm. I think. Um, I, we, Ross and I were talking about this before <laughs> in relationship to both our own parents and, and the <laughs> children that we're raising, that you don't get to know what you're screwing up until yeah. they're in their mid-20s and they hate you. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Um, yeah. They tell me some of the stuff that I'm screwing up. They're pretty, <laughs> they're pretty frank. Um, but I think the stuff that, the stereotypical stuff that people say about mm -hmm. kids, that they're elastic, that they, mm -hmm. you know, keep being kids even when really bad stuff happens is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're okay. I hope they're okay. I'm doing everything I can to try and ensure they're okay, but I know I'm screwing them up in a million ways. Um, the marathon stuff starts there. I mean, raising mm -hmm. kids is a marathon. It's, it's a lifelong job um, yeah. that you don't get to opt out of, uh, no matter how much you would want to on some days. Um, 
And, and in order to be good at doing that, in order to be good at doing my job um, as a lawyer, um, in order to be a decent friend, um, in order to have, you know, hopefully future relationships with, mm. um, with other partners, I have to take care of myself too. I have yeah. to do lots of little things. And, um, you know, I, I think like most people would be more inclined to have instant gratification for a lot of that mm. stuff. Like, fix it now, get me the thing that's missing in, in my life. Um, so I've learned, and, and the, the thing that you said about the fight or flight, it, it, looking back on it, the first two months after Nina died were relatively <laughs> easy. Not in the sense of like it was easy and it was like nothing happened, but I knew what to do. We had yeah. to do a memorial service. The book came out. The, you know, I had to find childcare for the kids. There was, a, there was a narrative. There was like a narrative arc to it and it had to happen. And there was no, just other, you know, I don't know what would have happened if, if we hadn't done those things. But, um, but then the dust settles and there yeah. you are. And you, you still have this narrative that you haven't written yet and you don't know how to fill in the blank pages. So yeah, yeah. and that takes a lot more stamina. So. Well. I think you're doing a good job. John, thanks for being with us today. Thanks great. a lot for having me. <clears throat> <clears throat>